few days ago, someone came to me and asked for a birthday blessing. And so the blessing I chose was, may you have the strength to deal with whatever comes up. And she looked disappointed. <laughs> she said, can't you wish for me to be happy all year round? And I said, I can't promise that. You're in the wrong world. We live in a world where there's gain and there's loss. There's status, loss of status, praise, criticism, pleasure, pain, where things go well and things go not so well. And they simply want nothing but the good stuff. It's very unrealistic. Which means that we need to have the strength to deal with the bad stuff when it comes. I've been reading a lot of biographies of French figures, and I found that the ones that I admire the most are the ones who face some really difficult situations, and they know that it could be the end of them. You know, they don't let their worries overcome them. They do worry, but there's part of the mind that says, well, whatever happens, I'm going to try to be able to deal with it. There must be a way out. And in some cases, the situation looked really bleak, and yet they were able to find a way out. Talleyrand is one. The French Revolution began. People like him were getting their heads cut off. And he managed to get out of France with permission from the government. This is because he used his ingenuity. So this is one of the things that helps us deal with the situations as they come up, is the confidence there must be a way out. I'm not going to let it go past and say, well, I, I didn't try. If it turns out there's no way out, well, at least you try. So that's the kind of equanimity you want to develop. There are two kinds of equanimity. There's a kind of equanimity that says, okay, I'm just going to be okay with whatever comes up. And that kind of saps your strength. Makes you say, well, I don't know if it's going to be worth the effort to make any changes, so I'll just learn how to accept things as they are. And all too often that's portrayed as what the Buddha taught. I saw an interview one time with someone who was saying just that, that it's all about learning just to go with the flow and not to try to make any changes in life, just be equanimous about everything. And the interviewer asked the person talking, isn't that defeatist? And the person being interviewed said, well, only if you think about it, which is pretty sad. Are we supposed to not think? Of course we're supposed to think. The Buddha thought a lot. He set down guidelines for how to think. He didn't say not to think. He said, think in terms of appropriate attention. Think in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Ask yourself questions about what's skillful and what's not. Put things to the test. Evaluate them. And there's a lot of thinking that goes on the path. So we're not trying to cut off our brains and just say, well, I'll be like a vegetable and accept whatever comes. The equanimity of the Buddha is the equanimity that says, things may be going poorly, but I'm not going to let that sap my strength. Just accept the fact that things go well sometimes and not so well other times, and look inside to find strength. That's strong equanimity, or the equanimity of strength, which means, of course, if you're going to develop that kind of equanimity, you have to strengthen yourself through conviction. That if there's going to be a way out, it's going to depend on your actions. Through persistence, just keeping at it regardless. Being, once you're confident that you're on the right path, what path could be better than the path that says, look at your actions and see where they're skillful. Look at and see where they're not skillful. Encourage the skillful ones, abandon the unskillful ones. It's a path where you're, you're made responsible. 
And so it's a good path to be on. So once you have confidence in the path, just stick with it. And John Mahabua talks about when he was first getting started on meditation practice, he noticed that his mind was getting going in cycles. It would progress for a while, the concentration would get better, and then it would regress. And then it would progress again, and then it would regress. And the problem is he started anticipating the regress. And sure enough, it would come. And finally decided, this is ridiculous. Just stick with the path. Make the cause as good. And as for whether the mind is going to go in cycles or not, don't pay attention to that. Just stick with the good causes. And kind of pass that sort of self-imposed cycle. So this is the kind of equanimity you want that's based on conviction, persistence, and then mindfulness. Just keep remembering what's the appropriate thing to do. Remember to recognize unskillful qualities as they come up in the mind. Recognize anxiety when it's skillful, and recognize anxiety when it's unskillful. There is skillful anxiety. It's, it's actually called otapa, or compunction. combined with heedfulness. In other words, you realize there's work to be done, and I can't just sit around not doing it because I don't know how much time I've got left. It's that the anxiety part is, I don't know how much time I've got left. But you do know you have right now, so don't throw away right now over your worries about what's going to happen down the line. You've got this moment. Make the most of it. That's when you focus your anxiety in a way that it actually becomes something skillful, compunction, heedfulness. So remember what, what's unskillful in the mind, remember what's skillful. You've got lots of voices in the mind that sound very much like you, because they have been you at different times in the past. So you have to learn to recognize which ones in there you can actually trust. All too often we focus on the negative ones, saying, well, they're the ones that are telling us the truth, and the positive ones are kind of out of touch with reality. But then you have to ask yourself, who are your friends? The ones who try to destroy your practice or the ones that are trying to encourage it? This is a truth of the will that we're developing here. They're truths of the observer that simply watch. Then your desire for something to be one way or another can't get in the way. You have to simply look at the facts. But there are other truths that happen only if you want them enough, and then act on that desire in a skillful way. And the path is the second kind of truth, so the voices that encourage that kind of truth that say, you do have the potential, you do have what it takes within you to follow this path. So those are the voices you listen to, and you remember that. And based on mindfulness, when it's done properly, you get into concentration. That's even more strengthening. You begin to actually see the results. The mind can settle down. There's a sense of well-being where you can observe the mind very clearly and feel at home here. And whether it's jhana or not jhana, it doesn't matter. The fact that the mind is settled is what matters, and that the mind is clear and mindful, alert. So as the concentration develops, you can ask yourself, well, what here in the concentration is a disturbance? What can I let go? That lightens the burden of the concentration and actually makes it more solid once you've let it go. Now we've got concentration working together with discernment. All of these things are strengths. And they strengthen your equanimity so that it does become that second kind, the kind that is willing to face the fact that there are difficulties, things are not going the way I want them to be, there are setbacks, but I'm not going to let that become an excuse not to practice or become an obstacle to the practice. You've got to have confidence that, yes, there, you do have the resources. 
because after all, this is a path that many people have followed in the past, people of all kinds. They were able to do it. They're human beings. You're a human being. You can do it, too. So the equanimity that allows for that thought keeps it going, that doesn't get knocked around by setbacks. That's the kind of equanimity you want to develop. Remember that story of the Zen master whose student was going to come out to L.A., try his hand at the entertainment industry. And the Zen master asked the student, when the student came to say goodbye, what are you going to do if they knock you down? The student said, well, I guess I'll have to accept that. And the teacher said, no, they knock you down, you get up. They knock you down again, you get up again. That's the kind of equanimity you want in the practice. The equanimity that doesn't take defeat as the final word. And doesn't get upset saying, gee, this, this human realm should have been perfect. Everything should go well. Or the, or the attitude that says, if there's a setback, well, I'll just learn how to accept that and give up. That's not equanimity. That's defeatism. Equanimity, equanimity realizes we live in a world where we've made mistakes in the past, so we're going to have to be dealing with the results of those mistakes. But we can learn from them. So it requires a certain amount of equanimity to admit the fact that you made a mistake, to recognize the mistake, not to hide it from you. And that's the equanimity that will see you through.